Hello and welcome to Market Briefing. I'm Martin Backerdax, European Business Editor here at the IB Times UK. Well, we're wrapping up the week. It's been a wild ride for stock markets around the world, particularly commodities, but certainly just about everything else has been in flux amongst a week of really macroeconomic dominated news flow. It began, of course, in China on Monday with slower than expected GDP out of the second largest economy in the world. 7.7% was the expansion in the first quarter. Investors were looking something closer to 8. We should all be so sluggish, of course, to slow to 7.7, but nonetheless, that did raise a lot of questions early in the week about the health of the global economy. That ignited commodity markets around the world. Now, it has to be remembered that gold was on a downward slide, but on Monday, it fell 9.3%. That was the biggest single-day decline in 30 years, an absolutely astonishing run for global commodities began. We saw bear markets for most of them inside the commodities, the main S&P Goldman Sachs Commodities Index. That's down around three-tenths of one percent over the week, but it's been fluctuating most of the week with copper, silver, gold, oil, everything else moving very rapidly indeed as people sort of began to remark their considerations for global economic growth. Now, after the China data, the IMF released its spring forecast. They marked down global GDP and suggested the Eurozone will likely remain in recession for most of this year. They also marked down the United Kingdom as well, and I'll talk about that in just a minute because it does reflect the austerity versus stimulus debate that's going on right now. What we're looking at from a five-day point of view, though, is about a 1.3% decline for the FTSE 100, 3.3% in Germany. That's interesting for the DAX because we had German investor confidence tumbling earlier in the week, and clearly the German economy seems to be close, more closely linked not only to the Eurozone economic crisis, but also to the situation in China, it being one of the largest exporters in the world. Currency markets have been fascinating this week, too. The yen slide continues, although the pace has slowed down a little bit. Japan's certainly not slowing the pace of monthly purchases it plans in order to stoke inflation to that 2% target that the new governor has decided to chase. An interesting sidebar to all that, of course, was the story earlier in the week that McDonald's Japan is going to raise, going to raise the price of its basic hamburger from 100 yen to 121, uh, 120 yen each. It's a 20% hike from an inflationary perspective and well past the 2% target the Bank of Japan is chasing. But nonetheless, it suggests that businesses are trying to get ahead of the assumptive price rises that the quantitative easing is going to bring. Equity prices might have fallen a little bit further had it not been for good earnings data out of the United States. Around 100 or so S&P 500 companies have reported first quarter earnings so far this year. About 75% have beaten analyst estimates. Not so much, though, on top-line revenue, but nonetheless, that is a healthy reading for an economy that's still sort of in question with respect to its growth pace. Ultimately, that's going to be linked to the decisions taken from a budgetary and fiscal perspective in the world's largest economy. But the earnings potential and certainly the earnings record of the S&P 500 is pretty impressive indeed. Now, I mentioned the United Kingdom. We're going to get first quarter GDP growth figures next week. That's probably the single biggest benchmark macroeconomic data point that traders will look to next week. But the IMF in marking down its UK growth forecast also took a jab at the austerity policies of Chancellor George Osborne. That's interesting in a number of dimensions because, as I say, that austerity stimulus debate is probably the largest and, and most significant in the world of economics right now. And it was buttressed by an interesting controversy in the academic world about the data set that was used to support a paper penned by, amongst others, Ken Rogoff, a Harvard economist, who basically said that he had found, if not a cause, a certainly an association between high debt and low GDP. Now, it turns out that his data set was incorrect. It wasn't added properly, and there were numerous uh, sort of empirical errors inside the data set as well. It's a deep embarrassment, not only for the economists who wrote the paper, but for a lot of policymakers who used it, including Ollie Wren, the EC budget commissioner, to sort of uh, justify some of the austerity policies that are in place right now. So big debate going on there, unclear as to whether any of the policies that are in place right now are going to be adjusted as a result of the poor economic figures and indeed some of the academic attack that austerity is coming under right now. But nonetheless, the conversation has has not gone away. And you can imagine this is going to not only define the way that people in the academic and policy world discuss it, but investors as well. We're going to take a look at all of it next week, as we always do, and you can check it out on the Economy page. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you on Monday.